Hi, and thank you for joining me for another short talk. And friends, after this latest Sharia-inspired attack, which as you already know, occurred at an Orlando gay nightclub, many in the religious world seem a bit dumbfounded on whether publicly condemning such an attack would be in some way contradicting their religion. Because it is very well known that the Judeo-Christian biblical standard itself promotes heterosexuality as the ideal while at the same time condemning the act of anal intercourse between men as a toeva, as an abomination before God. And really the reason I decided to make this video was because there are many who have come out stating that although as religious people we should stand up against radical Islam, that at the same time we should remain indifferent with the victims because our religion supposedly calls out for their death to begin with, right? Because you wouldn't feel bad if a bunch of murderers were in some way executed, right? And friends, today allow me to share a position that I believe will give you a different perspective on this whole issue. Friends, first and foremost, you must understand that God does not hate homosexuals. And I know that this phrase is thrown around a lot of God hating or not hating someone or a group of people, but it is ultimately absurd to assume that God could hate anyone. Now, he hates the evil you choose to do and is definitely many times extremely disappointed with you. But no, your creator holds no grudge, especially when he created you with the heathenistic inclination for evil and in many instances even tolerated unavoidable obstacles in your life that in the long run makes it harder to live a life or make decisions like others do. Also, friends, to hate constitutes an inability to do something about it, which, as you know, is not something the Almighty claims to have a problem with. In other words, the Hebrew Scriptures has him wiping people out. However, because the actual act of homosexual sex or the ability to perform that act is something that needs to be available to us in order for free will to mean anything, this forbidden act of gay sex is certainly, certainly something that the Almighty can hate. Why? Because he is powerless to stop it. Powerless how? In other words, he would undermine his whole human experiment by just stopping us from choosing what's wrong. So I think the real crux of this topic is not does God hate actively gay homosexuals, meaning those practicing gay sex, but do we feel that he expects us to? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. Just like one is supposed to hate anything or anyone that deliberately works against the social principles laid down in Torah. So that old saying of love the sinner and hate the sin is really not a biblically sound one for the creator or his creation to embrace. However, and there is a big however, what if I told you that the sanctioned hate I'm referring to does not apply to 98% of self-identifying homosexuals in the world today? But rather, it is really referring to is the practice of gratuitous homosexuality. Mainly the homosexuality that was prevalent in societies like Greece and Japan and can still be seen in other primitive societies of today where males choose to engage in the practice for either ceremonial, i.e. idolatrous reasons or to conform with some social norm or just out of plain curiosity and not to what 98% of homosexuals today feel and embrace as a lifestyle. Which is why it's not a coincidence that this prohibition of male-on-male -male sex appears next to the one for bestiality, another practice that was either culturally or ceremonially mandated by societies of old or perhaps out of curiosity and not because humans were born with some sexual attraction to animals. Now, if you believe that homosexuality is fully a choice and not something someone is hardwired with, then you have no religiously reasonable reason to embrace this approach. And the reason I'm giving this lecture in the first place is because I believe that the homosexuality prevalent in the world today is not a choice but also not something that someone is born with but rather the result of emotional trauma typically at an early age and you know we all have things in our lives that we have to deal with some things make us stronger and others more vulnerable to certain behaviors however this is where a religiously sanctioned compassion comes in now the final result is the same in either case any type of male and male sex requires the death penalty by the court again by the court, by the Sanhedrin, and not by us. But friends, there's a huge distinction made between 
the compassion we have towards someone because in such a case they would warrant it and someone we just toss on death row. And the truth is that in Judaism, compassion, a truly justified compassion can even end up saving one from the death penalty. We see a similar example of this brought down by the Rambam in Hilchot Mamrim where he brings down examples of people condemned to die but then utilizes the notion of Tinok Shenishba, of someone who has been theoretically mentally handicapped to state that they deserve compassion. And there is no difference, no difference with the example that we're dealing with today. Also, not to mention that Judaism itself allows us many opportunities to exercise compassion, mainly because for the court to condemn one to die, you would need the testimony of two witnesses, one if you're not Jewish, and even a pre-warning that you acknowledge the consequences. In other words, by people having compassion, the case never really becomes a case at all. And in terms of individuals who take it upon themselves to assume someone is guilty of a crime without a due process, and the person then took it upon themselves to play judge and executioner, that person would be liable for the death penalty themselves according to Jewish law. Now friends, I'm no moral dummy. I understand that in terms of an unethical act where one person was abusing of another, due process or not, you would be required to act in the aid of that victim of, uh, to attack the Rodef. But that is when there is a victim. But who's the victim when gay sex is involved, especially if it's consensual? So what can easily be determined is that when the Torah describes the act of gay sex, it's not describing an immoral or unethical act, but rather what it is describing is an unholy act, or even one can say an irreligious act, which is still very important to observe, but by definition leads us to believe that some thought has to be associated with its execution. So what's the conclusion? Friends, it is absolutely proper to support the victims of the Orlando shooting even in the name of our religion. Now the biggest proponents of those you should hate are the college liberal professors who teach non-homosexual students that social sexual norms should not exist and actually get their students to experiment. They are also the scum that the Torah expects you to hate. And friends, this comes from someone who does not support the redefinition of marriage, who fights against the degendering of our children, and someone who believes that the homosexual lifestyle is inferior to the heterosexual biblical one. And yes, I'm someone who also stands on the side of the victims who were unjustly murdered during the Islamic Orlando massacre. And friends, for more information on everything Jewish, please visit TorahJudaism.org. Thank you.